Good morning and welcome to the ICG's Digital Academy webinar series. I'm Lucy Wernick, ICG manager, stepping in with running our webinars before we hand over to someone else. Today's webinar is by Chantal Cornelius of Apple Tree Marketing. More about Chantal in a few moments. Just for those who aren't members or who aren't familiar with the ICG, the ICG is a hub of nearly 450 independent market researchers within the UK and abroad. We collaborate and share knowledge and experience for the benefit of members, clients and advertisers. So if you're a client or an agency, find your perfect consultant or team of consultants through us. If you're a freelancer or small business, please join us. If you're a supplier of research or business services, advertise us with us. We look forward to hearing from you. We are grateful to McGowan Transcriptions for sponsoring today's webinar. They are an award-winning company with 25 years experience, provide a second to none and speedy service, specialize in a range of research sectors and are totally data compliant. Free phone them for a quote. And don't forget, if you're an ICG member, they'll offer you a discount. See their ad on our supplier directory for details. Our webinars qualify for MRS CPD certification. Remember to ask for a certificate if you need one after the session by either emailing me or downloading it from our website. Throughout the webinar, you can ask questions by typing them into the chat box that you'll see on your screens. We will ask a range of questions in the middle and at the end of the session. If you think of a question after the webinar, you can either send it through to me and I'll forward it to Chantal or send it to Chantal directly. And if you wish to tweet about this webinar, please do so copying in at the ICG. A few more slides from me. Two dates for your diaries. Our next webinar is on the 20th of June and that's about defining your elevator pitch with Dean Russell of Win That Pitch. This is open to everybody and Thursday the 4th of July in a central London venue before our summer party, we're holding a collaboration festival for ICG members, giving you the chance to learn more about the online tools designed for collaboration, to explore how to grow through collaboration with the ICG and also network with other ICGers. Look out for publicity about that soon. So now introducing our speaker for today, Chantal Cornelius set up Apple Tree Marketing in 2000 and since then has helped hundreds of consultants and trainers to grow their businesses. She provides simple, practical and down to earth advice to help small businesses to grow. She has written and published two books on marketing and business survival and is regularly asked to speak to groups of businesses on these subjects. Chantal successfully uses the ABC of marketing to keep a steady stream of new clients knocking on her door. She can do the same for you too. Please welcome Chantal. Okay, so thank you very much for that lovely introduction, Lucy. Hopefully, everybody on the webinar can now see my screen with a slide that should say the ABC of marketing. So good morning and welcome and thank you very much for joining us this morning. So did you know that in the UK, something like half a million new consultancy companies are set up every year? That's a huge number. Sadly, the vast majority of them don't actually survive beyond, beyond one year. The last time I looked at the numbers, the, it was only about 4% uh, about of businesses that are set up that actually make it through to 10 years old. So there are lots of reasons for this and I'm going to share with you this morning some of some of my tips to help you guys survive longer in business and I'm guessing that no matter how long you've been in business you're on this webinar because that's the sort of thing that, that, that you need some help with. So as Lucy said I'm Chantal Cornelius I've been running my marketing company Apple Tree for over 18 years now and I am a big fan of simple practical marketing some marketing consultants will try to put together a strategy for you and go very high level. I do do strategy, but what's really important to me is finding, looking at 
the marketing tactics that work for consultants. And what I often find is that, that people will be trying a multitude of different marketing activities. They'll be doing dozens when actually there aren't that many that you need to do. And I've simplified this into my ABC. So that's what I want to be sharing with you this morning. Here they are, the ABC, and you'll have to forgive my, my creative license here. So A is ask for referrals, B is business networking, and C is content. So I'm gonna take you through these three this morning. Now what I'll do is I'll talk a little bit about A, and then I'll say, do you have any questions? If you have a question, as Lucy said, pop it into the chat or the question box and we'll be able to see those questions. If you have a question as I'm speaking, pop it in there so that when I say, anyone got any questions, then we can, we can answer them. Depending on how many questions there are, I may not be able to get through all of them, but I'll, I'll do, do my best. And as Lucy said, I am available afterwards if you need to contact me, if you'd like to go through something in a bit more detail. You're all muted on this session because otherwise it can be a bit too distracting with other people's phones ringing and dogs barking, which is why we ask you to use the chat box. So let's get going and talk about referrals. Now, when you're a consultant, you're selling a service. You're actually selling yourself. And this means that you don't have anything tangible. So you don't have something like this gorgeous mug, which is currently full of coffee. And you can't say to somebody, well, do you want the blue one or do you want the orange one? Do you want the big one? Do you want the small one? You're selling something that people can't actually see. And quite often you'll be asking for your clients for money before you deliver any results to them. So referrals are a brilliant way of growing your business because if you can be referred or recommended by a happy customer, somebody is much more likely to work with you based on that referral. If you think about the last time you were looking for a plumber or a builder, chances are you probably asked a friend or a neighbor. My neighbor actually asked me recently, she said, Who, who's your builder? So I recommended my, my builder, Paul. You're much more likely to do that than go to Yellow Pages, what's left of it, or, or even look online. And it's exactly the same with your business. So tip number one is around the best time to ask for referrals. And the best time, because, because I'm making an assumption here that, that everyone on the call is British. If you're not, I apologize, but we do have a very reserved uh, attitude in this country of, oh no, I couldn't possibly ask for a referral from somebody. So the best time to do it is actually when somebody says thank you to you. So you've just completed a brilliant piece of work for a client, you've just had a debrief session with them or you phoned to check that everything was okay and they say, oh, thank you so much, that's exactly what we needed. They are at that point in a really good position in that they're thinking nice thoughts about you, you've just done what, you need, what they needed you to do, you've helped them solve a problem. So that's a really good time to say to them, you're very welcome, obviously, and who else do you know who might need this sort of help? And if you can gear it around asking for a referral based on what you just helped them with, so much the better. So for instance, if a client says to me, thank you so much for helping with my marketing, that was really helpful, really useful, I'm not gonna say to them, okay, who else do you know who needs some marketing support? Because marketing is a huge topic, a bit, a bit like market research. So focus it on what you've just been working on with them and that will actually help them to think more specifically about who they might be able to recommend you to. Now, they may not be able to think of anybody at the time. They may want to go away and think about it and that's fine. And that's where point two comes in, in that you need to be structured in asking for referrals and you need to record who you've asked and when. What you don't want to do is be asking the same people over and over again for recommendations and referrals. So if, if somebody gives me a referral, that goes into the list. I know, I know who I've asked, I know where this referral came from. I'm not gonna go back to that person a week later and say, can I have a referral please? So I will, I will I, it's worth storing it. I actually use a database where I record all of, all of these details. Um, so really useful to have some sort of a database or a spreadsheet if you're going and having a meeting with a client and you haven't asked them for a referral for a while, 
your spreadsheet should show you that you haven't and that would be a good time to, to, to go in and ask them. And the third point there is about asking for LinkedIn recommendations. I'm going to talk throughout the webinar a little bit about social media, but it's a huge topic. So if if we get lots of questions about social media, we might have to run a, run a separate webinar on it. But LinkedIn is a really LinkedIn is actually the social media platform that I recommend most for consultants to use. And one of the reasons is because you can ask for recommendations. So if a client has sent you an email saying, thank you, that piece of work was awesome, or you're great to work with, or you really helped me solve this problem. What I like to do is reply to them, obviously saying, thank you very much, lovely of you to say that. And would you be happy to put those words into a LinkedIn recommendation for me? And all they then have to do is copy what they've said and paste it into, into LinkedIn. Obviously, you need to make sure that you're connected to them, which you should be if they're a client of yours anyway. But it's really simple for them to then do a copy and paste job and create a LinkedIn recommendation for you. I did it a while ago. I had a new client who sent me a beautifully handwritten Christmas card and in it, she wrote some lovely comments about how I'd helped her. I typed up her words, emailed them back saying, loved your Christmas card, thank you very much. Would you be happy to put this out as a LinkedIn recommendation? Five minutes later, it appeared on my LinkedIn profile because she didn't have to do anything. It was just copy, paste, and it's there. So if you're thinking about asking somebody for a LinkedIn recommendation, I, I advise that there is a system on LinkedIn where you can request them. I wouldn't use it. I've used it a couple of times. It never works. I think it's too impersonal. So if somebody emails me and says, thank you very much, if somebody phones me and says, thank you very much, I'll take the words that they say and actually write up a, a, a recommendation and send it to them and say, this is, this is based on what you said, would you be happy to say it? The easier you can make it for somebody to recommend you, the better. So I don't go to people and say, would you write me a recommendation? Write about whatever you like. Because often people say, well, what do you want me to write? So I might give them some pointers. So like I said, make it really, really easy. And my final bonus tip for when it comes to asking for referrals is say thank you properly for referrals and recommendations that you receive. So every time I receive a recommendation or a referral for somebody, I send that person a handwritten thank you card. I actually keep a supply of cards in my in my office and I pick the most appropriate one. I quite like making cards. In fact, I'm just going to show you because I can do this. I'm going to show you. So this 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 is this is not one I made. This is one that somebody else made. This is a lovely lady called Jackie. She I helped her with something in her marketing and she took the photo of tulips and printed on it. Thank you, Chantal. And she sent it to me. And it's it's been sitting on the windowsill above my desk for the last month because I love it. And it's handwritten inside. So that's the sort of thing that, that you can do, whether it's handmade or it's a, it's a bought card, but send a card to say thank you for a recommendation. As and when a recommendation actually turns into a piece of work, I then send a thank you gift. And I do a bit of research to find out what would be most appropriate. So last week I took on a new client and the chap who recommended me I actually phoned him to, to, it was his birthday, and I phoned him to say, happy birthday, will you be opening the bubbles later? And he said, no, no, I, I don't drink. But my wife has bought me some beautiful cupcakes. So I sent him a box of cupcakes to say thank you for recommending me. And he actually phoned me that the, the day that they arrived to say thank you. So always send something to say thank you for recommendations, because if you don't, people will stop recommending you. So those are my tips for asking for referrals. Are there any questions on asking for recommendations and referrals? Oh, here's an interesting one. So question has come through. Is there a suggested finite number of recommendations on LinkedIn? No, you can have as many as you like. The important thing with LinkedIn recommendations is to make sure that they're up to date. So if your last recommendation was given to you two or three years ago, you need to do some work on that. You need to get some more. I, I have a game that I play with my business and my clients and that I aim to get one new recommendation every month. So that's going out and asking people for a recommendation. But at the same time, I will give a recommendation every month. 
I've seen quite a few LinkedIn profiles where somebody might have 50, 60, 70 recommendations, they haven't given any. And that to me is a bit of an imbalance. It's actually really nice to be able to give somebody a recommendation. So it could be a client uh, who you know does a great job, it could be a supplier you've worked with. Um, I, I run a monthly speakers event and so I will quite often give a recommendation to one of the speakers because they're looking for, for more speaking work so it helps them. And it's really nice to be able to give a recommendation to somebody who's not expecting it. Um, it's always always nice to surprise, and it's just a nice it's a nice sort of balance thing. If, if I'm if I'm asking for a recommendation, then I will I will give one as well. But in terms of of the number that you can have, no, you can have as many as you like. Make sure they're current. I think once you've had a recommendation from somebody on LinkedIn, they can't recommend you again. I think if you if you change positions or they've changed jobs or they want to recommend you again, I think you might need to remove their their previous one. I don't know how to do that, but there, there might be a way of doing it. So. so the next area to look at is B is for business networking. Now I said earlier that when you're running a consultancy, you're selling a service and people need to get to know and trust you before they'll buy from you. So referrals is one of the best ways of doing this. The second best way is networking. So the last time I looked at my marketing, it's very important, by the way, to measure your marketing, find out what works and, and do more of it. And you do this by measuring. And the last time I looked, 42% of my current clients have come through recommendations and referrals. 42% of them have come through networking or me giving talks and presentations. So for a consultancy, referrals and networking, they are the, they are the, the two strongest. So a few pointers for networking. When you go to a networking event, it's not about trying to sell yourself. It's not about trying to give out as many business cards to as many people as possible. It's not about rushing up to people and saying, this is what I do, here's my business card, and I'm rushing off again. It's about starting to build relationships with people. And the best way that you can do this is by asking questions. I'm going to set you a challenge. I am banning you from using one particular question, and that is, what do you do? Why? Because everybody asks it. It's actually not a very easy question to answer, although I'm really pleased that there's a webinar running next week, next month about uh, elevator pitch, because that will really help with it. The problem with the what do you do question is that most people who ask it are not listening to the answer. All they want is for you to tell them what you do so they can get, oh, well, what I do is. So have a think about other questions that you can ask. And if you need some pointers, there's actually a blog somewhere on my website of 101 alternative questions. Some of them are a bit silly, but some of them are perfectly usable. So things like, uh, good morning, could you introduce me to the organizer of the event, please? Or are you the organizer? My favorite is actually, hello, would you like a glass of wine? Uh, now this doesn't work at networking meeting, uh, networking breakfasts, but if it's a breakfast, you could say, hello, would you like a cup of coffee? And it just is a way of breaking the ice. And if you're by the bar or you're by the coffee station, pour somebody else a cup of coffee and that will get a conversation going. My all time favorite is, do you come here often? And that normally gets a smile from whoever I ask it to. And it breaks the ice. It means we can get into a bit of a fun conversation. But you know, you can be asking, where have you, where have you driven from today? Are you local? Have you come straight from the office? How was your journey to get here? Have you been to this venue before? Do you know the structure of the of the event? Do you know the speaker? Can you introduce me to people? So there are lots and lots of different questions that that you can ask. And it's like I said, it's a way of getting a conversation going and building up a building up a relationship. If you are petrified of going networking, if you're the sort of person who stands at the door and you're all, oh, I don't want to go in, the thing to do is look around the room because probably over in that corner over there, there will be somebody standing on their own going, I don't, I can't talk to anyone. Please go and talk to that person because they're more scared than you are and they will love you for the fact that you've gone and rescued them. And it's not about rushing over and demanding to know what they do, but it's just going over and having a chat. So look look for the person who is more scared than, than you and, and go, go and give them some help. 
My next point is about knowing where your clients are. So there are literally thousands of networking events that you could go to. If you really organize, you can do breakfast, lunch, tea and dinner five days a week for networking, probably six or seven days a week these days. But it's much more important to go for, quanti for quality, not quantity. You're looking for events where your potential clients hang out. So I do a lot of work with all of my most of my clients are, are independent people in one one man bands and a lot of them are professional speakers. So I joined something called the Professional Speaking Association and I go to their monthly meetings in my local area. I actually host the meeting, which gives me even more exposure. So I'm not openly promoting myself standing on stage saying, hello, I can do your marketing for you, but I'm getting to know all the local speakers. So it's about, for you, it's about looking at where your ideal clients hang out and where do they hang out when they're not working? So if you can get to know, so for instance, training, training courses are always good. I will often go to networking events where there is somebody else speaking about marketing or sales because it means that the other people there are looking to learn about marketing and sales. So they're open to having a conversation with the speaker and with me about marketing and sales. I know I have a client who is, uh, she plays a lot of golf and she will network when she's golfing. Uh, she's actually, she joined a particular networking group that plays golf, but she can also go to the, go to the golf club and, and network while she's there. So look for networking events, but also training programs, training courses, conferences. I went to an interesting conference uh, in London a little while ago, which was actually all about publishing books. I was going along to, to learn, but I did meet some other interesting people who were also looking to write books and books that are good for marketing. So you will have to be a bit, a bit creative. The third point there is about being consistent. One of my marketing mantras is that ad hoc marketing does not work. So ad hoc would be going to one networking meeting then going back to the office and sitting at your desk and waiting for the phone to ring. It's not going to happen. You've got to keep going. You've got to spend time getting to know people at a networking group and allowing them to get to know you. You also need time to get to know whether or not it's the right sort of networking for you. So You've got to be consistent. You've got to keep going. So if there's a monthly meeting, I will put the date in my diary and I will go every month. If it's a new one, then I'll go for at least six months to, to test it out. If it's not working, if you find that it's not working after six months, then either stop going or look at what you're saying when you're there. I, I used to go to a very nice networking breakfast years ago. It was every two weeks, really nice breakfast, lovely people. And after six months, I realized that I was getting no business from it at all. So I changed what I was saying in my in my one minute talk and I still didn't get any work. I got a couple of recommendations, but to the wrong sort of clients. And I realized that I was going just because I like the breakfast and I like the people. It wasn't it, they weren't the right sort of people to, to, to recommend me. So I stopped going. So you've got to be quite strict with yourselves. Networking can, can get expensive and if you're going to a group that charges a lot of money for an annual membership and then for the meetings and then there's your travel costs and there's your time, don't forget there's your time involved, there's a cost to that. If that can all get rather expensive and if you're not getting enough out of it then I would be looking for other events to go to. Okay so some somebody's asked uh, for any more tips on, so if you're quite nervous about going networking, any other any other tips on how to how to get over that? One of one of my other favourites is make a beeline for the organiser of the event because usually the organisers will know everybody there. They'll have the list of who's who's attending. Sometimes you can ask for the list up front. It, a lot of these days, particularly with GDPR, a lot of people are very wary of giving out lists. So when you get to the event. Go and check in, go and talk to the organiser, ask then if you can see the list, see who else is there. And if not, ask who they can introduce you to. Because like I said, the organiser will know everyone and they can say, oh, yes, you, would, you might like to talk to so-and-so. And that means that you don't have to go and stand at the edge of the room thinking, I don't know who to go and talk to. 
Another thing to be looking at is the body language of people when they're networking. So if you've got two people who are like this, having a conversation, don't try to sidle in because they are completely focused on each other. If you've got three people, I don't have enough hands to do this, but if you've got, if you, if you find us a more open group, if you've got three or four people and they're standing a bit further back and they're not, you know, peering in and having a conversation with somebody, that's when it's easier to, to just kind of gently move into the area. Um, and when I'm networking, when I see anyone do that, I would actually take a step back and turn slightly towards them to welcome them into the group so that you're not standing here like this, because it, it can be a bit nerve wracking trying to get in on a, on a conversation with, with people. So if you're looking to join a group, look for threes and fours that are a bit more open. And if you're part of a group and somebody comes up next to you, just 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 step back, open, open up a little bit to, to, to let them in. So if there aren't any more questions for now, let's move on to the next point, which is content. Content marketing is a word, is a phrase that popped up a few years ago, and it makes me laugh because I've been doing content marketing for about 20 something years. We just didn't call it that originally. So content is the material that you share with potential clients and with clients. So it could be an email newsletter, it could be a blog, it could be videos, it can be webinars like this, it can be videos, it can be you speaking on stage, it can be you running a workshop or a seminar. So it's you sharing and delivering what's up here, your knowledge and experience about, about what you do. And I'm gonna keep saying this because it's really important. Consultants, service business, people have to get to know and trust you before they will work with you. So if somebody has read your newsletter, read your blog, seen you on social media, seen you, seen you speak at an event, listen to a webinar, they're much more likely to, well, they get a much better feel for what, what you can do and are you the sort of person who can help them. It's, it's, content is a great way of sharing your knowledge and expertise and of very gently showing off what you can do, showing your, your style. Again, I've got three pointers for you here. The first is please be generous. Share as much as you possibly can. Now, I, I sometimes have people say, oh, but if I share everything, then people won't pay me for anything. There will always be people, and I suspect there'll be some people on this, this call today who will take all the tips and advice that I'm sharing, and they'll take it away, and they'll put it into action, and they'll go off and do it, and they'll get new clients, and that's great. That's fine. And they won't need my help. That's absolutely fine because they'll probably remember where they got that information from, and they might still recommend me. There are other people who will try out some of what I've been talking about today and they'll have a go at it and then they might go, oh, I'm a bit stuck or I haven't got time to finish it off. Where did I get that information? Oh, I know, I'll go back and ask for Chantal. So be generous. I regularly give away copies of, of books if I'm out networking. I do sell copies of my books, but I sometimes give away copies as well because they are a really good business card. I actually spoke to a potential client yesterday who is now a client and I gave her a copy of one of my books about 18 months ago and I'd completely forgotten that I'd, that I'd given it to her and she said I loved your book and I've kept it on my desk all this time and now I'm ready please please can I have some help so give away as much as you can I always think about it. I like to treat my prospective clients the same way I would treat a client so if a client phones and says, can I have five minutes of your time? I need, I need to pick brains. Yeah, sure, absolutely. If a potential client phones and says, can I just ask a few questions for five minutes? Absolutely, very happy to do it. And you know, you just need to get over the fact that there will be some people who will take away your advice and do it themselves. There will be others who will come back and they are the ones who will, will pay you for it. Because if you think about it, if somebody says, I'm not going to give you any advice unless you pay me for it, whereas somebody else says, sure, yeah, you can have five, 10 minutes of my time, who would you rather work with? Who would you rather actually spend the money with and who are you more likely to recommend? So be generous. Secondly, create a plan for when you are going to share your content. So my newsletter, Scribbles, goes out on the third Wednesday of every month without fail, no matter what I am doing. Even if I'm on holiday, Scribble still goes out. 
because it's in the plan. Uh, confession, I haven't yet written next week's scribbles because it's due out next Wednesday, but it's in the plan and I know it's got to be done, so it's probably going to be a Friday afternoon job. But because it's in my schedule, I know that it needs to be done. If you're thinking, well, I don't have enough to say in a newsletter, then you actually then need to look at point three, which is plan for what you're going to say. And my advice there is that if you're, if you're not sure that you have enough to say, start small. So start with a newsletter or a blog every two months. I've met people who said, oh, I'm going to put out an email newsletter every week. And after four weeks, they dry up. They, they don't have enough content. And they don't have enough energy or enough time in their schedule. So work out what you want to send out. I, I actually, at the beginning of this year, worked out the topics for all 12 of my email newsletters. I'm doing a six part series for the first six months. And guess what? I'm going to do a six month series for the second part. And it's going to be a, a, re, a remake of the, the second six months will be a remake of the first six. So it'll be an, an update. And actually the newsletter, this is perfect timing because the newsletter I need to write for next week is actually about the ABC of marketing. So I know I already know what, what, what's going to go into it. I just need to sit down and, and write it. So plan for when and plan for what. And as I said, ad hoc marketing doesn't work. You've got to keep drip feeding. So even if you can only send out a newsletter every two months, make sure you do it every two months and that it always goes at the same time. So whether that's the third Wednesday or the second Tuesday or the fourth Friday, doesn't matter. Work out a schedule and, and stick to it and keep it, keep it going. Because people will actually get to the point where they'll be expecting to hear from you and they'll notice after a while when they don't hear from you. One of the reasons for planning what to say is I've met some people who say, oh, well, I'll put out a newsletter when I have something to say. The problem with that is that something else is always more important. It's usually client work and marketing gets sort of shoved over to one side. And you could find that after six months, you haven't sent out a newsletter. So plan what you're going to say and then plan your, your schedule for how for, for when, when you're going to send it out. And the same applies whether you're doing a newsletter, a blog, a video, an event. Be consistent, be planned with what you're going to send out. I've had a question in, or is it just a comment? Let me just have a notice just, down here. At this the comment, comment. Ooh, yeah, it's a comment. Yeah, go for it, go for it. Well, just, just to say that um, I'm sure a lot of you know, but we, the ICG are here to share our members' blogs, et cetera, through our websites and on our social media channels. So I just wanted to take the opportunity to say, use us as a vehicle, um, send stuff to me, and we'll help amplify that if we can. Thank you, Lucy. That, and that, that's, that's, a, that's a really great offer, and it's, it's, it's worth taking up. So if you guys have any material so a blog or a newsletter, send it over to Lucy and she will do what she can. Don't bombard her with masses of stuff. But, you know, if you've got one blog or one newsletter that, that you'd like to share. Um, I think actually that's how I ended up running these, these webinars because Lucy has been on my newsletter mailing list for quite a long time, I think. And I remember her emailing me once after I'd sent one out saying, this is a lovely newsletter. Would you mind if I share it with my members? And I think Lucy, you put it up onto the ICG website, and I probably phoned you and said, that was really kind, thank you very much, what else can I do? And that's when we got talking about webinars. But so you didn't you said, send me cupcakes, Chantal. I haven't yet sent <laughs> cupcakes. Right, okay, what colour would you like? Anyway, yeah. <laughs> you, yeah, you, you, yeah I, will, I will send you something, absolutely. And that, that's, actually, that's actually a really good point because I hadn't really thought about that. So I, I, I run quite a few webinars and talks for other people. And I probably do need to send a thank you to the organizer for allowing me to get in front of your audience and, and waffle on about marketing for, for 40 minutes or so. So um, cupcakes, duly noted. Oh, okay. There we go, on the list. So are there, any, does anyone else have any questions about content? particularly around social media, because this is where, tell you what, if you have any questions, type them in now and I will talk a little bit about social media because it, it's a huge area. And I, as I said earlier, LinkedIn, I think is the best 
social media platform for consultants to use because you can use it to share details of the work that you're working on, details of clients that, that you like to work with. If you've written a newsletter or a blog, you can actually publish that as a, as a LinkedIn article. And my advice there, well, it goes back to being generous. So it's not sales pitch, it's you sharing advice. Things like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, there are so many. People don't buy consulting services through those social media platforms. They're useful in that if people can, so for instance, we I, I put out about four or five tweets a day. They're all planned, they're all scheduled. I have a document of about 60 pages on a word file of tweets that are all tips that I pick up along the way. I'll sit and write, write them in, in talks that I listen to. Um, so they go out. So people who go and look at my website or, or LinkedIn, they'll see that I'm sharing useful advice. So that, that's the sort of thing you can do. But don't get too hung up on spending a silly amount of time on social media because it's, it's not going to bring you clients. LinkedIn is good because of LinkedIn recommendations, as we've talked about. But also it's a really good way of building up relationships. So had a question about newsletters. Yes, I do mention them a lot. Yes, I'm a big fan. So this one is saying, are you saying that this is the best vehicle for marketing because video is becoming more popular? Yes and no. So I actually think that what works best is a combination, an integrated approach when it comes to marketing. So I write an email newsletter every month because I love writing. Um, I actually set up my business originally as a copywriter doing content marketing. Uh -huh. So that's why I carry on writing my newsletter. I receive a very nice weekly email newsletter from a contact and she writes a bit of a bit of spiel. And then at the bottom, there's a video of her talking about what she's what she's written about. Quite often, I won't read what she's written. I nip straight to the bottom and watch the video because that's her and it's much more engaging. But what you what you need to be thinking about is your audience. How does your audience want the, want your content delivered? And it's very difficult to know these days. So if you have a very young audience, yeah, they're more likely to want video and Instagram and live stories. But if you have an older audience, then written material with videos is, is probably better. So I would go for an integrated approach. I would look at doing a bit of both. You could, for instance, you could send out a written email newsletter one month and then do a video version the next month. Or like I mentioned with this, this, uh, this one I receive on a Monday morning, do the written and then drop the video in. Now that's quite a lot of videos to do. I actually had another one pop into my inbox this morning, which comes monthly and that is similar format. There's, there's the written bit and then there's the video at the bottom. Where's the video at the top? There's a video in there somewhere and I'm more likely to go and watch the video rather than reading because that way it actually allows me to engage more. So I would I would look at doing a, a combination of both. My advice there as well with the videos is make them as professional as you can. Now I'm not saying you have to rent a rent a studio and have a green screen and have it all singing or dancing. Because these days, I mean, I've I've got I'm looking into my little my little camera that's perched on top of my 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 screen at the moment. And I can record videos through it and I've set up the office behind me so that it looks nice and tidy um, and that there isn't too much sort of stuff in, in the wrong place. So I've got a nice background so I can record a video easily. I don't have any members of staff. I used to and I used to every now and then say to them, I get we have a proper proper SLR, digital SLR on a tripod and I would park it somewhere and get somebody to sit behind it and video me can't do that anymore, don't have staff. I've got this little toy up here on my on my computer. You can do it on mobile phones. I see too many people wandering around doing this, pointing pointing a phone at themselves. And the videos just look a bit a bit weird when they do that. So I would go for something static like like a camera on a tripod or perched on your computer. And do think about what you're going to say because I've seen some sort of like, oh, hello, uh, morning. Um, uh, I don't know what to talk about this morning. That doesn't look professional. So do this. This goes back to plan for when and plan for what. So if you're going to use videos, do do have a bit of a bit of a plan. So oh yes, let me share this with you. So this is an example of a two and a bit three month schedule that I recommend that you use for your marketing. So down the side 
you've just got some examples there. So we've got networking, newsletter, blog, LinkedIn, and speaking. So these, these are just examples of some of the marketing that you might be doing on a regular basis. And then we've got weekly across the top for, for two and a bit months. There wasn't room to put a full three months in. And it's then a question of, it's a case of putting the information into this sheet. So you could use a spreadsheet. I actually have a whiteboard in my office, uh, which I updated at the end of last, end of 2018. So it runs for the whole of 2019. So I can look at it and think, okay, yeah, okay, that's, that's what needs to be done this week. This really helps with the consistency of marketing. And like I said, ad hoc marketing doesn't work. You need to drip feed. It also helps if you can get, so if there's a regular event that you go to, so the speakers event that I do is on the third Thursday. So that's in my diary for the rest of this year. I won't miss it. I did miss one early this year because I was on holiday, but you know, that happens. But it just means that you don't get there and think, oh, oh, flip, I've missed that event, it's tomorrow, and I've got something booked in with a client. I'm quite strict with my clients. They are not allowed to book me on the third Thursday afternoon of the month. So get them into your into your schedule. If you're going to be doing a, something like a newsletter, so I've got in there on the schedule, write it in the first week, publish it in the second week. What you can then do is take your newsletter and split it into a couple of sections. I regularly do this and put out two different blogs based on the content of the newsletter. It means that you can keep sending out useful content on a regular basis without having to write new stuff all the time. So it's about integrating but repurposing the material. So have a, have a look at a schedule and set, set yourself something up. The two great secrets of marketing, prizes to anyone who gets this. Um, the first, is this one ad hoc marketing does not work be consistent with whatever marketing you're doing work out what you've got time to do what you can afford to do and keep doing it on a regular basis and the second one do more of what works and less of what what marketing doesn't work which means measuring your marketing asking people how they heard about you measuring the networking events you go to and seeing how how effective they are in bringing you the right sort of, of, of leads and if it doesn't work stop doing it now i'm not saying so i i don't get any direct leads from my newsletter but i know that it brings me business eventually like i mentioned earlier i sent a newsletter out to lucy and this is how i ended up doing this webinar so but but measure everything that you do so final bits and pieces for you here. If you would like Scribbles, which I've talked about, please go to my website and, and sign up. It's free and the next one will be out next Wednesday, Wednesday morning, because I will get on and write it. If you would like some help, some one-to-one -one help, and you'd like me to spend a bit of time with you, either on the phone or by Skype, we can do a review of your marketing. And this is where we'll just talk through what marketing you're currently doing and how it's working for you. And then I can give you some recommendations on how to improve it. And also, just for you lovely people, uh, Magnetic Marketing is the first book I wrote, and it's all about how to do your marketing. Um, and that's available for just £10 at the moment. Go to the website, there's a, there's, there's a page on there. Um, somebody has said, please do run a separate webinar on LinkedIn. Um, so that's that's a comment. Okay. Somebody else has said, is it better to have recommendations on your personal LinkedIn page or the business LinkedIn page? Uh, you actually, as far as I know, you can't have recommendations on your business page and you can only have a business page if it's linked to your personal page. So go go personal, very definitely. What you need to look at is people can recommend you based on what which job you are at. So if you've had 59 different jobs, they'll pick the one that they're recommending you for. What you really want is the is the is the most recent, unless you're running three businesses at, at once. So yeah, go go personal page definitely. Okay. Um, somebody said um, this goes back to your point about asking for a referral based on what you've just done for them mm -hmm. by asking them to focus on what you've been working on with them for a referral, presumably you mean the subject matter of the project, e.g. new product development? Yes, yeah, yes, sub subject matter, absolutely, because if you just said to them, uh, okay, so it's it's marketing research, do you know anyone who might need some? 
it's a big topic but yeah if you've been working with them specifically on new product development ask them about that yep um, another one what do you think about asking for a recommendation a few months after you finished working for someone I wouldn't leave it that long I would I would ask sooner because if I was talking to somebody recently who said that when he does some work for a client he, he doesn't do any sort of final debrief or was everything okay and I suggested to him that he does do that he either goes and has a meeting with the client or they, they book a phone call to say okay so I've delivered this bit of consultancy is it okay is there anything else two reasons firstly you can ask is there any more work you'd like me to do and secondly you can say would you please give me a LinkedIn recommendation and I would do it yeah, much sooner. I wouldn't leave it a couple of months. They will have forgotten about you by then. Trust me, they've got a lot going on. They will have forgotten what you did, how it made them feel. So I would I would ask pretty quickly, actually, yeah, within within a week or two. And if you're having a, a, a final sort of debrief meeting, do it, do it then. OK, yeah. if you, just a, a few more. Um, can you recommend, do you know of any good resources other than the ICG for where um we can find business networking events for market research the short answer is no because i've never looked um i would i probably do a google search to find out if i, I really don't even know if there are any other associations that are specific for, for, for market research um but if you're i would be thinking more about who your clients are so if your clients are marketing directors for organizations, look for the sort of events that they're going to go to, which might be things to do with the CIM, the Chartered Institute of Marketing, or the Marketing Society, that, that sort of thing. So I would really focus it on yeah, who your who your clients are, look for where they hang out. What are the recommend what are your recommendations, re keeping top of mind with people you've met at networking events? So this is this is one of the reasons that I'm a really big fan of newsletters. I have something like 1500 people on my on my mailing list. And so when I meet somebody at a networking event and they give me their card, I will usually say, would you like me to send you a new, my newsletter? And as somebody said to me the other day, she said, well, why, why would I say no? Good point. So so newsletters are a really easy way of keeping in touch with people, a large number of people on a regular basis. I also um, I grade my prospective clients high, medium and low. So high level prospects are ones who I really want to work with and they're, they're really interested. On my database, I put in forward contact dates and I can run off a list. I have it here on my desk. It sits on my desk. Look, it's here. Here's my, here's my, here's this week's spreadsheet. Um, this shows me the prospects that I need to follow up with or who I am following up with this week. So these are all the high level ones where I've said, let's have a phone call or let's let's arrange a meeting um, so it depends on the number of prospects that you're following up with the number of people you want to keep in touch with i am i'm i've been reconverted to being a, a fan of the telephone i spend a lot more time now phoning potential clients to talk to them and maybe offer them a marketing review or invite them to an event I rarely will send them an email saying, would you like to come to the event? I'll phone them and say, would you like to come? And then you can have a much better, much better conversation with them. So online marketing, things like blogs and newsletters are great for the drip feed, keeping in touch. But then there's actually nothing that nothing better than, than phone or face to face meetings to, to, to build the relationship. On average, what percentage of your time are you spending on marketing versus client work? So I work four days a week. And I spend three days a week doing client work and one day doing sales and marketing. So normally I spend all of Monday doing sales and marketing. I, I do bits of marketing on other days. So if I phone somebody on a Monday and they're not there, I'll leave a message saying I'll phone you back on Wednesday and I'll phone you back on Wednesday. But on average, I spend about a quarter of my time at the moment doing sales and marketing. That's partly because I'm having a bit of a, a push to, to grow my business at the moment. But even if you're even if you're not looking for massive growth, I would say you need to be spending at least half a day a week doing doing sales and marketing activity. And if you can schedule a regular time, I, I, I used to try and do Friday afternoons and I would be too tired by the end of the week and not want to do it. 
and then I realized it was much more important. So Monday, Monday is marketing day. That's that's when I do mine. So okay. a couple report. more. Mm -hmm. Hi Chantal, I am nervous about sending an email newsletter since GDPR. How do you decide which potential clients to add to your mailing list? Thank you. If you have a client, a paying client, you are absolutely allowed to send them an email newsletter. There is nothing in the GDPR rules that say you can't. If you've never sent a newsletter before, what I would do is compile a list of all your clients, send them the newsletter and say in the introduction, this is my first newsletter, I'm sending it to you because you're a client, I hope you enjoy it, if you want to unsubscribe, etc, etc. Now by law, you have to have an unsubscribe link in your newsletter. We, we use a system called MailChimp for all of ours, and they put it in there automatically and you can't remove it, so it's there. But I will point it out to people. I'll say, if you really don't want the newsletter, scroll down to the bottom and, and, and hit unsubscribe. So for clients, you're absolutely fine to send it. For other contacts, prospects, and other people that you know, um, and, and actually a good place to start is LinkedIn. Look through your LinkedIn contacts. You used to be able to download all of your contacts. You can't do that anymore. So it's quite a good clean up job is go through your contacts and decide who you want to add to your, to your newsletter mailing list. I would then send them a special introduction version saying, I'm sending you this because we're connected on LinkedIn or we met at a networking event, that, that sort of thing. So it's, it is, if you're going to be completely GDPR compliant, you would only send a newsletter to clients and you wouldn't send it to prospects. If you want to be brave, then I would say send it to prospects and make it blatantly clear to them in the top that you're sending it to them because you've had some sort of contact with them. If somebody's connected with you on LinkedIn and you have no idea who they are, I wouldn't send it to them. So only send it to people that, that, that you actually know and make it super clear that they can, they can unsubscribe. Going forwards, every time you're networking, ask people if they'd like to receive it. When somebody asks me on LinkedIn to connect, if I want to connect to them, I do. And I reply saying, is there anything I can help you with in your business right now? And would you like my newsletter? And they'll come back going, yes, please. And then you can add them. Just a couple more. Can we get a copy of the charts, please? The answer is yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> Lucy, Lucy, um, we've got my slides, so you can you can send them out. We will them. put that on the those on the website um, and share that link. Any practical tips for how to say thank you to clients or suppliers beyond sending Christmas gifts or invites out to lunch? How do you balance too little versus too much that makes clients hesitant to accept? Okay, so. If, if a client works for a large organization and some of them are still not allowed to accept gifts, do some research first. Find out what you are allowed to send, what they are allowed to accept. So if you wanted to, if you've got a, a, a particular person in an organization, you know that if you sent them a box of chocolates, it would just get shared around the office, then I would send them a handwritten thank you card and, and see what else I mean, even, even sending a box of chocolates that they have to share, that's fine because it, it, it's a nice thing. I probably wouldn't send them a bottle of wine or champagne because that's a harder thing to share around the office. So send something that they can share around. With smaller companies that will accept anything, then you're fine. You can, you can get wildly creative. Um, I was talking to a guy actually earlier this morning who his, his branding, is his colour is pink, fuchsia pink. I've got one of his notebooks. Hang on, bear with me a second. There it is. There's one of his notebooks. Um, and he actually said he, he collects pink things and he has a shelf. He has a pink filing cabinet in his office um, and he collects pink things to send out. So it might be a dinky little box of chocolates. It might be some bath salts. It might be a, 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 a squidgy stress toy. Um, so you can you can get a bit creative and have some fun with the branding linked to your business. So even you know if you've got somebody who's not supposed to accept gifts, I'm pretty sure you could still send them a little squidgy stress toy. Um, I sent some mugs to a client once actually. They I went to see them and they they had some new mugs put in the kitchen which were horrible and they didn't like them. So I sent them. I think I went on to Photo Box, which is a website where you can upload photos and images. And I actually put, I created some mugs that had my logo on one side and their logo on the other side. 
um, and, and sent, sent them to them. So, you know, thing, things that can be used by people in the office that still have your branding on that people will remember. So, yeah, have some fun and get creative. Does that answer the question? Two more. Two, okay. two more questions. Okay. Um, and then we'll, this is I, fun. I like this bit. Yeah, right. Would you recommend automated feedback, e.g. sending a link to a satisfaction survey? No. <laughs> no is the short answer. Um, no, because if you, if you really want feedback from a customer, you need to ask them face to face or on the phone. I, I have recently been asking some of my mentoring clients why they work with me and the answers were not what I was expecting. But I need to know what those answers are because I'm rewriting the content for my website. So no, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't do anything automated. It's too impersonal and people will look at it and go, oh God, it's yet another email and oh I'm having to write stuff down. If you can phone somebody, you guys should know this, you're in market research, phone somebody and have a conversation with them and dig deeper into why why did you say that? You know, I, I got something through from it might have been Vodafone recently, and I gave them a really low score for something and they said why have you given us this low score? And part of my answer was because you keep sending me these automated surveys and you don't take any 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 um, notice of what I say to you, and you keep asking me for to, to fill in boxes. So no, I would I, I would I would keep it personal and make make a phone call. <laughs> How would you start building a marketing or prospect list? What sources would you use? Okay, so I've spoken to two clients about this this week, so I know about that, I know this one. So start by looking at your existing customers and your past customers. One of my new clients has been in business since 2014, and he is actually gonna be looking back at all the invoices he sent all the way back through his business. So he's gonna be, so he's got them on some, he must have them on some sort of invoicing software, but I've suggested to him that he puts them into an Excel spreadsheet. So clients first then start looking at the business cards that are probably floating around your desk or your office start looking at those and adding them look at if you use something like outlook for your email look through all your contacts there and add them but add the ones that you want to add um, and then look at things like linkedin and do a, do a bit of a cleanup job so every now and then when i go through linkedin i think i don't actually know who that person is and i if i don't want to be connected to them i i won't i'll, I'll I'll disconnect so do a bit of a cleanup but the ones that you want to stay connected with put them onto onto a list and I, I always recommend that you kind of get everyone in one place so I have I don't store contacts really on Outlook I have my I have an access database that's where that's where all the details go and in, that includes details of what color cupcakes they have when their birthday is when they when they last went on holiday what the wife's called what the dog's called um, and then I use MailChimp for sending out the newsletter, but I don't store useful information in there. That's just name and name and email address. Um, so that that's it. Start start wrecking your brain for all the people that you've ever worked with, who would be relevant, and select the most relevant ones and put them on a list. That's it. And then keep keep building it as you go forwards. Please please do get in touch. If if we didn't answer your question or you have any other questions, please do get in touch. I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm very happy to help. Very happy to help. Okay. And thank you for having me, Lucy. Cupcakes are on their way. Yeah. Pleasure. <laughs> Thanks a lot. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.